materials uh, available to me. Uh, so just a very, very brief introduction in computed tomography. It's, uh, it, it reconstructs the distribution of attenuation coefficient, which is essentially proportional to density, from x-ray measurements uh, all around the patient. Uh, and we use a reconstruction algorithm to, to take all that projection data and, and produce uh, a map that undoes the superposition uh, it, that, that was inherent in, in the projections. Uh, nowadays, our, our scanners uh, do this in helical modes, so rather than collecting one slice at a time, we image a full volume. And we do it uh, with multi-detector row scanners. So again, the earliest scanners had a single row of detectors to image one slice at a time. Now we have dozens and dozens of these rows of detectors collecting data in parallel, and we can image a, a volume much, much more quickly. Uh, that, uh, the, the, these developments uh, have, have caused, uh, are part of the reason why the speed of CT has grown so tremendously. This is a plot of, uh, and I'll tell you more what this parameter is, it's essentially a measure of the speed of data acquisition of CT as a function of time. Since uh, the first CT scanner was introduced in the early 1970s, here you see what those pictures look like and, and their uh, matrix size uh, compared to what our scanners look like nowadays. So you can see it's uh, more than a seven order of magnitude in increase in the speed of CT. And this is measured either in raw data points measured per second or uh, pixels that can be reconstructed as measured per second. The black line is Moore's Law, uh, and, and the speed really uh, increase of CT has little to do with Moore's Law, but you can see it tracks it uh, in, in terms of the uh, speed of that improvement. <clears throat> what that speed has done is it's made CT a much more reliable test than it would have been than it was in the 1970s. And uh, as a result, patients can come, come into the hospital, into the emergency room, and be very quickly uh, imaged. Uh, it, a great deal of information is provided by these images. And as a result of that, we see this tremendous growth in the number of CT procedures performed in the United States. This is in, in one institution. But in, in the number of CT procedures performed in the United States has had a similar growth. Here you see something like a threefold increase in a period of about a decade and a half. And it's a good thing because the information that's provided really benefits the care of those patients. The flip side of that, though, is that the radiation, uh, CT does use x-rays and that's ionizing radiation. The growth in the use of CT as well as in other diagnostic tests uh, that use ionizing radiation means that uh, in the United States in 2006, this is the distribution of uh, radiation dose to the U.S. population. This half of it is uh, naturally occurring radiation. Man-made radiation now in the United States is responsible for roughly half of the ionizing radiation exposure to the population as a whole. And CT is half of that. So a quarter of the radiation exposure to the United States is from CT scanning not because the dose from any single CT scan is high, but because of the utilization of it. It's being used so much uh, because of its success. I think it's important to state that the benefits of CT far outweigh the risks that may come from that radiation, so it's a good thing. On the other hand, I think it's incumbent on us to try to reduce that. I bring this up because it as a result of that, it's a technology driver. If you look at the things that are pushing CT technology, reducing radiation dose is one of those things. So um, the things that are driving CT technology, as I mentioned, dose reduction is one of them. And historically, improvements in image quality was and still is probably the biggest driver, and improvement or development of new clinical applications. So these are the things that continue to drive the engineering of CT systems and um, how, how is it that we're going to do that? And what are we going to look at in this talk? We're going to look at platform improvements, that is, you know, the hardware of CT scanners and what can they do. Uh, we're going to talk about imaging speed, spatial resolution, and dose efficiency as metrics of that. We'll talk about reconstruction algorithm. And related to that, something I, I'd like to say a few words about image quality assessment uh, with these new reconstruction algorithms a bit about applications, and at last I'll close uh, with 
whether uh, we, we will see a convergence of, of system designs or a divergence and, a, and a, 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 a separation of system design. A lot of stuff that we're going to talk about, and as a result, I'll tend to be pretty granular in the stuff that I'll talk about. We won't go into a great deal of detail on too many things, but feel free to ask questions. So we're back to this slide on speed uh, of CT as a function of time. Uh, so how is it that we've, we've gotten to, to have this phenomenal increase? Uh, part of it comes from faster rotation times. So gantry rotation times used to be on the order of minutes back here, and now they're fractions of a second. So that's part of what drives this, and the other part is more slices per rotation due to the multi-detector row scanner. So, so let's talk about these uh, individually. Here's a plot of the minimum rotation time as a, fa as a function of time during the uh, history of CT. So the initial scanners were a couple of minutes, uh, and you can see a dramatic reduction in the early years, and then a plateau, but really still uh, a pretty decent uh, uh, continuing improvement in CT scanning. Interesting outliers, though. Look at this one. This is the electron beam CT scanner that was developed in San Francisco. Uh, which was dedicated to cardiac scanning and had uh, an 80 milliseconds and 50 millisecond scan time, something like that. And these two that you see here are the two Siemens dual source scanners, which are roughly twice as fast as a conventional scanner. We'll talk more about them. But if we look at the underlying curve here, well, which way is it going to go? Is this going to continue flat? Are we going to still see uh, significant improvements in that rotation time? The main limit on how fast the CT gantry will rotate is the G-forces on the components of the gantry that are mounted on it. Uh, and this is a plot of the G-forces on the components of the X-ray. And the, the main one that's a problem is the X-ray tube. It's, you see that here. This is the X-ray tube. This is the detector. And as this thing rotates, these parts are trying to fly off the gantry, right? And so you can, this is for uh, the geometry of Siemens systems as a function of time, and we're sitting here now at 30 Gs. That's the force on the X-ray tube of a CT scanner. This is not trivial. Uh, this is much higher than the G-forces on an astronaut during takeoff of the space shuttle. Um, it's impressive that, that it's done this, right? And so I see no reason why this can't continue to go up. There's, it's, it has not plateaued yet, so we might as well project that it will continue. As I said, the main Limitation are the x-ray tubes, but the vendors have managed to make these pretty hard machines that can tolerate these forces, and I would say they'll continue to be able to make improvements on that. There's no physical reason why they can't. Um, so somewhere between a continuing linear growth or maybe a little bit less, keep in mind that the g-force goes as 1 over the rotation time squared. And so uh, even significant improvements in g-forces means that the scan time reduction won't be as dramatic as it's been in the past. But nonetheless, I would predict continuing shortening of the rotation time of scanners, which is currently uh, around uh, slightly less than a third of a second. I mentioned the Siemens dual source scanner. This is what it looks like. On the gantry, instead of there being one x-ray source and one detector array, there are two of them. And so the minimum rotation time becomes roughly 90 degrees instead of 180 degrees. So you could ask, well, why don't we keep going with this? What about three or four? Uh, can we do that? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, and here's why. This is a picture of a Siemens scanner with the covers taken off. Here's one detector array, the other detector array, one source and the other source. And if you looked at this, there is no room in there for anything. The only way you would get more uh, Beams is by moving the detectors farther apart, and that goes against G-forces and things like that. So I don't think we will get any more trend in this direction. I think two is about as high as that's going to go. So those are the speed improvements we can get. Slightly faster gantries. We've already doubled it because of sources. There is something more. The main application that drives rotation time or speed of CT is cardiac imaging. And we're currently at temporal resolutions of about 80 milliseconds or thereabouts. Uh, there are algorithmic approaches to try to solve the problem of residual motion during that 80 millisecond window. 
And I'd like to show you some examples of that. These are uh, scans of humans, they're, they're half scans, uh, reconstructed with a normal reconstruction algorithm. And what you see here is the distorted appearance of a coronary artery and similarly here. Uh, and that's due to the residual motion during the uh, x-ray scan. Uh, and the images that you see here are reconstructed from the very same data, but using the data itself, modeling the motion of the heart and correcting for the residual motion during the data acquisition period. You can see a dramatic improvement in the visualization of these uh, tiny little arteries. This is from GE. Uh, this is reformatted, so you can look at them uh, uh, coronally, and you see an improvement partly from the blurring reduction and also uh, improved uh, consistency between the multiple slabs that go into that coronary angiogram. This data is from Siemens using a very different approach to the same problem, an algorithmic correction built into the reconstruction. In their case, it's actually built into the model of the, of the system itself without the correction and with the correction. So now we've got two independent groups uh, with very similar results, which gives me pretty good certainty that this is likely to uh, bear fruit. So just to summarize this issue of temporal resolution, I think the uh, minimum scan times will continue to go down from, say, the current 250 to 300 milliseconds to maybe 150 to 200 milliseconds. Uh, with the dual source scanner, the temporal resolution is improved by another factor of two. And motion correction algorithms will have a bigger effect, at least in coronary artery imaging and hopefully in other forms of cardiac imaging as well. What about spatial resolution and, uh, and, uh, and detector resolution in particular? Uh, this is a plot of the minimum detector aperture in two directions. So there's one component of the aperture in the fan direction and the other one in the slice direction. So this is the product of them in square millimeters as a function of time during the development of CT. This is for GE scanners. You could plot on other vendors. They look pretty much the same. So that looks pretty decent, right? I mean, nice continuing reduction. Actually, most of this has been in the slice direction. So if you take out the slice direction, this is what it looks like. So actually, we had significant reduction down to the early 80s, and there has been no progress at all in the uh, spatial resolution of, in, of CT detectors in the fan direction since the mid-1980s. This is what the detectors look like. All of the commercial CT systems use what are known as scintillator photodiode detectors. There's scintillators, you see them, this little square, it's clad in a reflector to prevent crosstalk across uh, detector boundaries, and then they are bonded to photodiodes that measure the, the current, the, the, the light collected, uh, converted to current. Uh, and the problem is the, uh, the, the, ref the reflectors, uh, because uh, any x-rays that hit the reflectors don't generate signal and they're essentially lost. And so as it is, the geometric efficiency of our current detectors in the 60 to 70 percent range. People don't talk about this, but it's true. Our detectors are on the order of a millimeter in size, if you wanted to make them half millimeter in size, uh, pretty soon all you would have is white paint and you wouldn't have any scintillator left, right? So this is the reason that our detectors have not improved in spatial resolution. It's the technology of the detectors. What would happen if we could make them better? Well, obviously the spatial resolution of the systems would get better. But I want to show you that the dose efficiency of the systems and the low contrast detectability, surprisingly, would also get better. What I show you here is the modulation transfer function, and I trust all of you know about modulation transfer functions, uh, of the, uh, the, detect the detector aperture, the source and detector, uh, as a function of spatial frequency. And our sampling frequency with oversampling and quarter detector offset and these tricks is about here. So uh, we don't have much aliasing, and this is what the MTF of the sampling aperture looks like. Now. This, the noise in these detectors is independent from cell to cell. So the noise is actually white. So this is what the noise power spectrum looks like in the raw data. And this is the square of the modulation transfer function. The detective quantum efficiency is the ratio of them. So what that says is all of this 
space between the NPS and the MTF squared is bad because we have lots of modulation in the noise and very little modulation of the signal. The signal is getting blurred, the noise is independent. So if we could improve the aperture, does the sampling aperture make it narrower, for example with narrower detectors, and it looked like this, the amount of wasted signal, if you like, the mismatch between the noise spectrum and the signal spectrum would be much less. And I'll show you uh, and Im images that, that de demonstrate this. So a higher resolution aperture should dramatically improve mid to high frequency detective quantum efficiency at the same radiation dose. <clears throat> and here's a demonstration of what the images would look like. There are uh, two dots. The object is two little dots in a field of gray. This is two dots of high contrast, and these are low contrast. This is a uh, conventional or low resolution system, and this one has a sampling aperture that's half the size. And I'm assuming that the, the x-rays that are incident on the system and the fraction that interact or the quantum detection efficiency is the same. Very same x-rays, same dose. This is a conventional system. This is one with a high resolution aperture. If we had looked at this for a big blobby object, you would see no effect. But this is a high, uh, frequency task and the improvement that you see is dramatic. So what this would say is for these tasks that are looking for fine detail, smaller detectors would be a big advantage even if we don't reconstruct the images at, at higher spatial resolution. If you uh, subject these images to a numerical observer and look at the fraction of detected correct uh, readings, like did, was this two dots or one dot? Uh, this is what the high-resolution system would do compared to a low-resolution system. So it would be a dramatic effect. <clears throat> so th this is a, one of the problems with our detectors, and I'll come back and say something how, uh, uh, how we might solve it. There's another problem with our detectors, and that is electronic noise. We expect the variance in our measurements to go like 1 over the fluence. Or, uh, and, and, and so if we plot log variance versus log fluence, it should have a slope of minus one if it's quantum limited. And what happens is as the fluence goes down, as the signal goes down, eventually we run into electronic noise and the system is no longer quantum noise limited. And then all of a sudden the slope is minus two. So if you're operating down here, quantum noise would say you should have a certain variance, but the actual variance could easily be two or three times higher. And the farther you go down in intensity, the more trouble you'll be in. So electronic noise can dominate at low dose. And what this means is if we want to build systems for very low dose protocols, this will become a limit because our detectors are not able to operate at those low intensities efficiently. And here's a, demonstrated, a demonstration of that. This is uh, an actual scan of a cadaver at 4 MAS. This is a very low technique. Thin slice. And this is what the image looked like. This is what the image should have looked like if it was limited only by quantum noise. The way we did this is we scanned it at high dose and then predicted what the noise should look like when we reduced the dose level to this amount. Big difference and all of that is coming from electronic noise. So how could we get around this? Uh, one way we could get around this is by changing the detector technology and instead of having the scintillator photodiode detectors go to direct conversion photon counting detectors. So in these detectors we have a slab of a photoconductor or direct conversion material. X-rays come in, generate electron hole pairs which are swept by the electric field. And we don't need to have uh, reflectors because the electric field line confines the motion of the charge carriers. So this gets rid of the uh, problem with the paint. Now if in addition we were able to count individual photons as you do in nuclear medicine for example, then you get rid of the electronic noise component. Uh, so what this would let you do is have 100% geometric efficiency, no electronic noise, and once you get rid of the paint you can make the spatial resolution of the detector higher. In fact, it's likely to be inherently higher because of the need to count very fast. 
Now, if in addition you are able to do energy discrimination on the x-rays that you detect, you could have spectral imaging all the time, and you, you wouldn't have to, uh, uh, and I'll say more about this in a second, uh, have specific protocols for spectral imaging. It would always be there. The data would inherently be spectral. This is a, a simulation of what is anticipated as an improvement from photon counting detectors. This is from Thomas Clore at Siemens. These are simulations of a brain scan with a conventional energy integrating detector versus a photon counting detector at the same dose. And if you zoom in, you can start seeing details that you couldn't see. This is not from a spatial resolution improvement, but from a DQE improvement from the photon counting detector. And then, as uh, Thomas points out, spectral CT would be enabled if these detectors, in addition, resolve the energy of the individual photons. So photon counting detectors are very promising. Uh, they need further development. Current detectors are nowhere near fast enough uh, to be able to count uh, these fluences of, of high-power X-ray sources. Uh, so the count rate capability translates to scan speed, and, and clinically we can't sacrifice much there. The bigger problem is uh, imperfect and count rate re dependent energy response. And this is a technical problem that has to be solved. There's no law of physics that says it can't be done, but it's a significant engineering challenge. Uh, because of that, I think that the initial deployment of photon counting detectors will not be in the fastest, widest cardiac scanners. My feeling is that uh, there should be uh, systems that are optimized for conventional, scan say, cancer screening, radiological imaging, with uh, much more reasonable slab thicknesses and, uh, and perhaps scan times of a second or, or a half second which will make life much easier on these detectors and you could, you could deploy them. Whereas if you try to build the, the fastest, the biggest scanner with these detectors, I think it, the development time would be uh, astronomical. Uh, a little bit, a few words about uh, spectral imaging or, or dual energy imaging. We, uh, this is commercially available now on, on several systems. It's implemented by measuring with two different KDPs. Uh, and uh, here are two examples in patients with uh, neoplasms in the, in the throat. We're looking at images of the throat of two patients. This is a conventional uh, uh, grayscale image, if you like. And these images are of the iodine content. So you're using the energy information to separate out the iodine from non-iodine. And the difference in the two cases is, in, in this case, you can see that the iodine accumulation has crossed uh, the jaw here, whereas in this patient it did not. That was not visible on the grayscale image, but it is visible on the iodine image, and, and it uh, agrees with uh, histology. So it's an example of the kind of information that's available from spectral CT, provides additional material-specific information. As I said, it's commercially available either by back-to-back -back scans or two sources or fast KV switching from different vendors. As I mentioned, some uh, applications are already demonstrated. I'm sure more will come among the improvements as the data itself becomes more quantitative. The problem is that all the current implementations entail a compromise. On the Siemens scanner, if you have the two sources at different KVP, you don't get the speed improvement. On the GE scanner, if you're rapidly switching the KVP, it means you don't get the sampling improvement. Uh, energy selective detectors that I've been talking about, if they were available, wouldn't require this compromise. The data would be inherently spectral and it would always be there for us to use. So I think that's a, a main advantage. I'd like to talk a little bit now about the uh, slice direction of these CT scanners. I mentioned the progression uh, to multi-detector row scanners. And what they give you is more coverage per rotation but also thinner slices. This is a 3D view of a 3 millimeter colon tollet. It's actually in here, reconstructed with 5 millimeter slices. So you have a CT volume with 5 millimeter slice thickness. We're looking at a 3 millimeter polyp. This is with 3 millimeter slices, 2 millimeter slices, 1 millimeter slices. Right? Big improvements. There's no brainer. If you're going to do volumetric imaging, you want to improve uh, the number of slices or the thickness of the slices. 
So here's a, a plot of the number of slices per rotation as a function of time during the development of CT. The first CT scanner introduced actually was a two-slice two scanner. That, that old two-minute two, uh, brain scanner was actually two slices. There were a couple of those. Then pretty much they were single-slice scanner. I think this must have been the LSINT <coughs> twin. That disappeared. Single-slice scanners. And then <coughs> kaboom, the slice wars came about. And, and we saw a doubling of the number of slices <coughs> In, in CT scanners just every few years. Um, most commercial systems are sitting at 64, but you see that there are some that are higher. The uh, highest one is the Toshiba uh, 320 detector row scanner. Uh, the purpose of the scanner, if you think about it, is to scan a 16 centimeter volume in a single rotation. So we can image 16 centimeter volume repeatedly several times per second. The reason you want that is for perfusion studies. That's one of the reasons, right? And, and here is an example of CT perfusion to look at cerebral blood flow and cerebral blood volume to triage patients in acute stroke. And, and the reason you do this is that there's a flow abnormality uh, from the, from, from the uh, ischemia, uh, and the blood volume abnormality indicates tissue that is already likely dead. Any mismatch between blood volume and blood flow is viewed as uh, a region that is perhaps salvageable. This is much like the MR way of looking at things between flow and diffusion changes. And so in this case, where there's a significant mismatch and, and revascularization here was done, you can see a much smaller final uh, stroke as opposed to this patient where uh, by the time the patient was seen, it, uh, the, the fate was pretty much sealed. This is what that scanner looks like, the uh, uh, Toshiba Aquilian 1, and it can, as I said, do brain perfusion, and it can also image the entire heart in a single very fast rotation. So are all of our scanners going to look like that? Is If you go to the to UC Davis Medical Center, are all the CT scanners going to look like this? Uh, it, it really depends on the differential performance in key applications. And currently, the, the applications that this machine is good at is cardiac imaging and uh, perfusion imaging. Um, frankly, I don't think that a major medical center needs 10 of these. Uh, but perhaps you might have one or two for those special procedures. One of the reasons that you might not want a, a scanner like that is it does have some disadvantages. And one of those disadvantages is cone beam artifacts. So this is a CT scanner that has a simulation that has a 10 centimeter coverage in the axial direction. And these artifacts that you see here are coming from these bones that are angling through the volume. And there are uh, inherent um, uh, uh, deficiencies in the data from a cone beam system that don't allow you to properly reconstruct those structures at the edge of the field of view. So these cone beam artifacts are fundamental uh, and they are a limitation in any of these wide cone systems. Um, that's this. So the disadvantages of wide cone systems are cone beam artifacts, cost, these detectors are very expensive, and scattered radiation from the wide cone. The benefits I mentioned before, uh, dynamic volume coverage, no slab artifacts, uh, consistent uh, contrast enhancement. And again, I ideal in particular applications, but my view is unlikely to become the dominant general purpose system. Some years ago, we tried to solve the cone beam problem by building a system that's crazy. So you have to bear with me. I have the podium. I can talk about whatever I want. So I'm going to talk about this project that we embarked on, which was to build a CT scanner that had a wide array of multiple rows of x-ray sources and a single small detector. So the whole CT geometry is turned upside down. The reason we had multiple sources in the z direction was to get rid of the cone beam problem. It has other advantages. One of them that was actually pointed out by my collaborator, uh, Bruno Deman, is this idea of a virtual bow tie that I'll talk about in a little bit. But we actually built the system. Here's a, a photograph of it. This is the uh, x-ray source. It has 32 
X-ray sources, the detector is up here. Uh, and uh, believe it or not, it actually rotates. It's sitting in a wooden box uh, to handle the possibility that these things actually do go flying off. So the safety people said you have to put this in a wooden box. But we scanned some things. This is a post-mortem image of a rat that was collected uh, with uh, the first stage when we had only uh, eight of the sources running at a very low effective technique. Uh, and of course you can do 3D renderings of, of things like that. But the big problem with the scanner, if I back up, is uh, the construction of this, the complexity of the x-ray source and trying to rotate something like this at high speed. So I'll come back to that. And, and I, I, I want to now talk about the dose problem uh, before I return to that issue. So if you remember, half of the radiation dose to the U.S. population is man-made, half of that is from CT. We've really done a lot to reduce this over the recent years. Uh, we have lower dose radiation protocols, we have much better collimators on CT systems, statistical reconstruction that I'll talk a little bit about, and X-ray flux control, such as MA modulation. Also, importantly, our professional societies are now much more cognizant about radiation issues and are working much harder to reduce the radiation dose to their patients. Why do we use radiation at all? Well, we need it to make the X-ray transmission measurements and the statistics of the measurement, the noise in the measurement, comes from the x-rays themselves. If you ask the question of what determines the variance or the noise level in this reconstructed pixel right here, it's uh, roughly proportional, the variance is roughly proportional to the sum over views of one over the number of x-rays detected in that view. That's how the noise propagates through the system. The impact of this simple equation is that if you have some views with a very low number of photons, they'll kill you. It doesn't matter what the other ones are. If you have a few of these, that they will dominate. And that's why the noise tends to look streaky in CT. It's because these measurements are noisy. So a few measurements with low intensity can dominate the noise. And ideally, you would like to equalize that in some optimal way. We have two ways of doing that. One is called a bow tie filter. It's sitting here between the x-ray source and the object, and you pre-attenuate the bright, what would otherwise be excessively bright rays, and not so the middle ones in the middle. The other thing we do is we modulate the x-ray tube current, so we use more x-rays in this direction than in, than in this direction. So we have some ability to sculpt the uh, radiation intensity but one of the things that this system let us do, and what that virtual bow tie idea is, is if you can tailor the illumination from each one of these sources, you can make the incident intensity whatever you like. And in particular, uh, for this object, if you uh, perform an optimization, it would suggest that uh, source number four should uh, modulate like that, source number nine like that. And this was all optimized to minimize the, the noise for a given radiation dose or, or uh, uh, and, and you can show that uh, doing this will improve your dose efficiency by more than a factor of two. I have a student who said, yeah, but that's very complicated. Can't we do this in a simpler fashion, and in particular, mechanically? So here's a, a cross-section. This is what the sinogram or the log data should look like. If you have a bow tie whose transmission looks like this, this is what the detected intensity in the sinogram should look like. Now, what if we could make a piecewise linear bow tie? So here you see what the bow tie looks like as a function of time. Piecewise linear, dynamically varying, optimized during the scan to uh, do whatever you like. You could equalize the dynamic range or you could minimize the radiation dose. And here's what the detected signal intensity would look like. How would you do that? How could you make a piecewise linear dynamic absorber? So what Scott Shea uh, realized is that a piecewise linear function is made from triangular basis functions. So if you could make a triangular absorber whose intensity you could control, you could make a piecewise linear function. And the way this works is there are, there are wedges that are moved in and out of the fan beam. And depending on how far in or out they are, they present a triangle of a different height. 
and there's two overlapping rows of them, which then allow you to make an arbitrary piecewise linear function by driving these attenuators. Here's what a, a simulation of what the benefits from this uh, should be. Here's a, a scan of the lumbar spine uh, cross section at the same dose with a standard bow tie versus a dynamic attenuator. So this dose was the same, and I think you'll see that the radiation, that, that the noise level is lower. If you want to inst instead keep the noise level the same and ask how much dose reduction can you get, uh, again, in the lumbar spine or in the thorax, the percentages that you see are the dose for the same peak variance. Uh, let's not talk about the middle two. This is a standard bow tie. This is the piecewise linear dynamic bow tie. So 65% the dose, and if anything, you find that the noise is more visually appealing because it's less streaky due to the ability to control the modulation. Okay, so that's uh, another uh, area of dose reduction. The last one I'd like to talk about is image reconstruction. Uh, uh, for decades, the workhorse of reconstruction in CT has been filtered back projection. Um, it's computationally efficient or fast, and if the raw data are perfect, filtered back projection is perfect. It is an exact reconstruction of it. Problem is, if the raw data are not perfect, then this may not be the reconstruction algorithm you want to use. So we've seen introduction of uh, advanced reconstruction methods in commercial CT systems. Some are called statistical reconstructions. We don't really know what's in them. Uh, and others are uh, iterative uh, model-based reconstruction algorithms, which are much more like the ones you may have been taught in your image reconstruction classes. They fully, oh, excuse me, fully model the physics and, uh, and noise and errors and iterate back and forth, minimizing some objective function. Can be computationally intensive, but we now have computers that are fast enough to be able to do this in clinically reasonable scan times. And I'd like to show you examples of what you gain from these. So this is a fairly dose, low dose protocol, thin slice, axial cross section, and a coronal reformat reconstructed with filtered back projection. And this is with a statistical reconstruction, uh, an ACER uh, available from GE. FBP, ACER. Which one do you like better? <laughs> you know, it's, a, it's an obvious answer. But let me ask you another question. Do you see anything in this image that you don't see here? Anything here that you don't see here? And there's no question this, this calcification is sharper. You see that here in the aorta as well. The background noise is lower. But if you ask, do I see any, anything that looks real here that I don't see there, my answer is I don't think so. Okay, same image, that FBP. This is the model-based reconstruction. Okay, FBP, model-based <coughs> reconstruction. I see a huge difference here. You're seeing structure in the liver that you didn't see before. You can see the wall of the bladder and this stone in the bladder totally invisible in the original image. So no question that these model-based advanced reconstruction algorithms are uh, very powerful. Here's another study that was done by Dominic Fleischmann, who's a radiologist in my department. Um, images of the liver and kidneys with FBP, ACER, and MBIR same patient at two different MAs. So MA goes down, the image gets noisier. This is what we expect. Even with ACER, the MA goes down, the image gets noisier. With, with this model-based reconstruction, the MA goes down, and the image gets uglier. But if you actually measure the signal-to-noise ratio, it doesn't get lower. Because it's baked into the reconstruction algorithm. The reconstruction algorithm is going to produce the signal to noise ratio that is being asked of it at the expense of other things. Sorry. This is a plot of the noise level as a function of tube current for regular filtered back projection, ACER, and, and the model based reconstruction. Again, model based reconstruction shows almost no variation in signal in noise level as a function of tube current. But if you ask the radiologist, is the is the information content the same? They'll say absolutely not. They know that these images here are way better than the ones here. So what this tells us is noise level and signal to noise ratio no longer tells us anything about information content of a CT image. 
with these nonlinear reconstruction methods. The other thing that you find, and I won't go into detail, is the resolution becomes contrast dependent. So we're used to thinking of the resolution of a CT system as being a fundamental parameter that we can measure. All of a sudden, it's not. It depends on the contrast level. So these statistical and iterative reconstruction algorithms are tremendous advance, certain to have an impact. The impact is highest when the data quality is poor. Significant dose reductions can be obtained, although perhaps the manufacturers are trying to oversell them. A big difference is among methods, and we need new image quality metrics because our old standby linear system metrics of image quality don't work with these nonlinear reconstruction methods. Just a, a, a minor th thing that I want to talk about, we've been talking about conventional CT scanners. There are special purpose CT scanners that are, are being developed and used. I can't come to UC Davis and not say anything about breast CT. So this is uh, excellent work that's being done for dedicated breast CT scanners. Uh, work is being done for dedicated orthopedic CT scanners. I think that's likely uh, to continue and, and we will see very interesting applications of those. Phase contrast CT is also being talked about. Uh, we could talk a whole hour on this topic. But I just want to now summarize what we've talked about in some conclusions. Uh, as I see CT development, say, in the next decade or two, uh, I see continued improvements in spatial resolution, in temporal resolution, I'm sorry, partly from continuing reductions in the rotation time and motion correction algorithms, which I think are, are looking very promising. Uh, widespread use of iterative reconstruction, which we are now starting to see, I think will become more routine. I hope for higher resolution photon counting detectors. I'm not sure that a decade is long enough to see them introduced. But I see them deployed in a targeted fashion, not necessarily on all of the systems immediately, but perhaps special scanners that have high dose efficiency versus a different special scanner that does cardiac imaging. Spectral imaging available for problem solving all the time. That would be great. Higher detective quantum efficiency, especially at mid to high frequencies, as I showed uh, earlier. Lower radiation dose. Uh, new clinical applications are going to be enabled by the improvements of technology. That's always been the case, and I don't see that uh, ending. And, and the last thing I'll say is I think we will see continued variety in system optimizations. Uh, in the last five years or so, it's been quite interesting. Siemens has done dual source scanners because they want high speed. GE has done high resolution scanners with uh, excellent dose efficiency. Toshiba has gone after the wide cone scanners. I don't see that converging. I, uh, to me, the wide cone scanners are not going to be the highest uh, dose efficiency. And temporal resolution and spatial resolution are a bit at odds as well. So I think it, it, it'll be interesting because we will have a variety of scanners to choose from and perhaps have a variety of scanners in hospitals for different uh, uh, purposes. So thank you very much. Exciting times ahead, I think. Questions? On your issues related to spatial resolution, and you showed those really nice abilities to detect differences in the points spaced closely together, I noticed in your slides that there was a focal spot of one millimeter, and then a focal spot of 0.5 millimeter. Yes. And you, I think you alluded to it, but you really didn't mention the effect. The overall resolution is going to be, of course, dependent upon the magnification factor as well as the focal spot size, and what that what that means is that there's going to have to be some advances in X-ray technology as well, <coughs> right? X-ray tube technology. So actually, I'm, and it wasn't in, on this slide. This is it the was one in the next slide, or uh, maybe it's previous. One. There it is. Previous one. Yeah. One millimeter source. One, so so what? The, in order to calculate the MTF here, I assumed a one millimeter source, a uh, one millimeter source, a one millimeter detector spacing, hundred <coughs> micron reflectors, and a magnification of one point seven, which, which is typical. typical. Right. And now, if I want to improve the sampling aperture by a factor of two, the easiest uh, conceptually is to narrow both the source and the detector. Right. So that's what I did. Yes. So in this, in this thing here, now we see uh, 
a half millimeter detector spacing and a half millimeter source. So your point is a very good one. Okay, I've, to I've told you how you can make the detector apparatus right. and what, what about the source? What about the source? Okay, so here's my feeling about that. If we, if we make the source narrower, we will take a hit in power. But for if, if we have a higher dose efficiency system, we probably don't need all that power. So I think, you know, if we can get a factor of, of two in dose efficiency from these various things that we talked about, like the dynamic modulator and things like that, that takes care of a factor of two of the four okay. from having the, the... So where am I going to get the other factor of two? Uh, what I, the, the idea that I have about that is to, you know, we, we're already doing focal spot wobble, right. but you can use that to um, illuminate more of the target spread the heat out, continue to spread the heat out over the same thermal focal spot on the anode, but scan it on it. Oh, okay. So at any instant in time, the focal spot is small, but it's moving. In order to live with that, I'm sorry for this long answer, in order to live with that, you need a really fast detector, right. but photon counting detectors are fast. So that's my okay. vision for that. Um, certainly, I think it's a... Um appropriate thought process because, of course, the overall resolution is going to be dependent upon the cascade of the detector aperture, the focal spot size, and all that. Right. That's right. I appreciate right. that. Answer. And, you know, the, 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 the hottest tubes right now, I think, are 120 kilowatts, and I sure hope we don't need more power than that. I hope and, not. And I'm, I'm hoping that we can throttle that down a bit. Yeah. I, I agree. Uh, is there going to be any problem as we go faster in rotation speed? With respect to uh, the focal spot itself, are these going to be emitters, cold cathode? Are they going to be emitters of, or are they going to be the, the standard filament type you know, thermal? Uh, um, so I, I don't I don't think there are problems with distortion of the shape of the focal spot. Are right, these high G's? Uh, I, I think that the, whatever there is has been taken care of. Okay. But. Um, there's a new Siemens tube that I believe is a cold cathode emitter. It's not, uh, it's not a uh, carbon nanotube, but it's a, like a, a dispenser cathode. So I think we probably will see uh, abandonment to some extent of thermal ionic yeah. uh, emitters, but I don't think that's essential. Okay. Well, appreciate those answers. Although, although I will say that Siemens claims for the same power, they get, get better resolution because they have a more uniform focal spot right. with these cold cathodes. Yes? I was wondering about the photon counting. What is currently achievable in terms of the count rates? And, uh, yeah, where, where do you think you have to be to make this really worthwhile? That's a great question. Um, if you uh, ask the question of if you take a current CT system at the current power levels that we were talking about and ask how many photons are incident on the detector uh, in a reasonable protocol, it's something like 10 to the ninth per second per square millimeter. Those are big numbers. Um, if you went to uh, Radio Shack to buy a photon counting detector, uh, so if you go to current <laughs> vendors to buy a photon counting detector, I think you can buy something that's in the few million. So more than two orders of magnitude off. If you talk to the vendors and the people who are working on them, uh, they're probably already at 10 to the 8th. For and how many millimeter or for a small size? Uh, so 10 to the 8th per square millimeter per second. The, the, at least I've seen people talking about numbers getting to that range. This is um, with a couple of energy bins, perhaps more, but I was talking to, uh, to Simon earlier. The problem is that these count rates, the spectra, this measured spectra are horribly distorted. So the spectral resolution is terrible. So you can buy detectors that are faster, say, on the order of 10 to the 8th right now. Well, you can't buy them. They're being made. Uh, the spectral resolution is not great. The ones that have good spectral resolution are probably an order of magnitude slower than that. Yeah. Uh, where do you see the future of CT in terms of the increasing pressure to reduce healthcare costs? <laughs> so, so where is CT and the increasing pressure to help reduce healthcare costs? Uh, many of us would like to believe 
that high technology actually reduces healthcare costs. If you uh, have a patient in the emergency room and you spend two days deciding what's wrong with the patient versus a half an hour, it makes a big difference. Uh, that said, I don't think there are any studies that demonstrate that high tech actually reduces healthcare costs. We all believe that it does, but we don't have the evidence. I think that what we need is evidence to show that, in fact, the benefits of high tech is there both in improved outcomes and, uh, and uh, 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 cost effectiveness. So I leave that to you to, to <laughs> do the studies uh, to, uh, to, to demonstrate that. Um, you know, healthcare is terribly expensive, and there's, there, there must be enormous amounts of money being wasted in it. I don't think that the cost of CT scanners or the fact that we use them is really high on that list. So we have to do everything that we can to reduce health care costs, but I don't believe that eliminating high-tech medicine is the way to do that. I have two questions. Uh, I have more, actually, but I can't read that. Um, so first question is, what is a limiting, fa a limiting factor in using multi-row um, detectors other than the cone artifact? And the second question is, um, in your reverse geometry idea. Why do we need to use that kind of, why, why can't we use multi-row detectors? Why not? Why do we need to use one small detector and oh, 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 I see. Sources. So uh, the, the answer to your first question, um, multi-detector row scanners in helical mode, there's nothing wrong with them. You can show that they provide sufficient sampling so there is no cone beam, cone beam artifact problem if you operate in helical mode. If you operate in axial mode, in other words, just a single circular rotation, that's when you, you get into the missing data problem right. with cone beam artifacts. So I'm, I'm not sure if you want a a, more of an answer to that. But um, so, so your other question is, why did we make the inverse geometry detector small instead of large? Well. You can get sufficient sampling with a small detector. You don't need it to be large. And if you make the detector small, the illumination at any instant in time is small, and therefore the scatter problem goes down. Right. Also, if you illuminated from each source the entire detector array, you wouldn't be able to do the virtual bow tie because you get that virtual bow tie idea by illuminating only a fraction of the object at the same time, at an instant in time. The problem with a small detector and collimating each of the sources is that the, uh, you're wasting a lot of x-rays. They, ne they never come out of the collimator. So you need higher x-ray tube power and there's other disadvantages to it. But the reason we made it small was scatter, to have more control, and to lower the cost by making the detector small. How long is the scan time? The, the scanner I showed you rotated in one second. You know, we've done uh, theoretical calculations that say we should be able to achieve the same sorts of scan times that we have nowadays. Uh, but I don't, I, I wanted to show, uh, the reason I showed it is not that I think that we'll see those in the next 10 years. In fact, our own research is going in other directions. I wanted to motivate the dynamic bow tie because it was, uh, it was spun off from the electronic virtual bow tie. Perhaps we can take one last question. Sure. If, if there are any more questions. Last question. What's your philosophy on taking bets with students? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I do it. So, what? Do you, do you know something about me and the fact that I make bets with my students? <laughs> Perhaps. Yeah. So, uh, let's see. I, I actually I did place a bet with a student. Uh, recently and lost. Uh, yeah, so I don't know which one you're talking about, but <laughs> I, I, if I make a bet with a student, the amount of money is small. Before we get into any, anything, different, <laughs> uh, the last act uh, for the, uh, the day is to uh, hand to you a little plaque that uh, we designed and made here in our prototyping facilities. Uh, recognizing you for your uh, uh, 
for your outstanding contributions in biomedical engineering in general, and thanking you for coming over here and giving us this excellent seminar today.